Good evening from Glasgow. Hamza Youssef, Kate Forbes and Ash Regan, the three people vying to replace the dominant figure in Scottish politics, Nicola Sturgeon. Her decision to step down has thrown the Scottish National Party into turmoil. The candidates attacking each other and their own record in government. Key party positions on how to deliver independence being trashed and the whole reputation of the SNP as a party of progressive politics and equality up for debate. Tonight, our exclusive poll shows Kate Forbes, whose campaign many thought had imploded last month, is now leading amongst the general public and among SNP voters is neck and neck with the self-styled continuity candidate, Hamza Youssef. Ash Regan trails behind, but could be the king or queen maker wielding the second preference votes from her supporters. It is, of course, SNP members who get to decide over the next 18 days. Tonight, a debate with consequences for the whole United Kingdom. Kate Forbes, you have attacked Hamza Record's record uh, with the NHS with huge waiting times at the moment. What has he and Nicola Sturgeon done wrong on the NHS? Well, it's actually been my privilege to serve alongside Hamza Youssef in government and to serve under Nicola Sturgeon for the last few years. And right now, we know that the SNP has had 16 years of winning elections because we were able to pivot, listen to the public, and then deliver. They trusted us. And this election contest allows us to think again how to ensure we can earn their trust on things like the NHS. I think we need to take a step back with the NHS. We need to empower the front line. We need to ensure that funding is going on the front line on our doctors and nurses. We need to look again at how we grow our talent with lifting medical uh, school caps. And we also need to completely reform social care through better wages, better terms and conditions to make sure that the average wait time when it comes to delayed discharge in Scotland isn't what it currently is, which is 28 so, days. So the reason this government is mediocre, in your words, is because they didn't put money on the front line. Is that what you're saying? Not at all. Well, you what just did, be, didn't you? What, a, what would be mediocre is if we continue to do what we've always done for the last few decades, when there are new challenges, new issues that need to be grappled with. We have come through COVID. We're in the teeth of a cost of living crisis. We've come through Brexit. The issues have changed, and our job is to listen, respond, and deliver. OK, Hamza Youssef, you saw there, you are fantastically unpopular. Is it because of the health service? Do you take responsibility? Well, first of all, actually, I've got momentum. I've quadrupled my support amongst the Scottish public in just uh, three weeks, and we know any campaign momentum is really important. About the health service, uh, first and foremost, uh, what is different up here in Scotland? Because we know the pandemic has, uh, has been a huge global challenge for health services right across the UK. What's different up here? Of course, Scotland is the only place in the entire UK where not a single nurse, not a single ambulance driver, not a single paramedic, not a single member of NHS, NHS staff have gone on strike because of my leadership. Also, of course, we had the fastest ever COVID booster programme anywhere in the UK. What we need to do is ensure that, first of all, we recruit and retain our staff. Fair pay helps with that. We need to make sure we invest and continue to invest in social care because that will prevent people from coming in the front door and get them out the back door in terms of delayed discharge. And then, of course, we have to make sure we are relentless in our focus on reducing waiting times, and they have reduced by 25%. But can't you see from that poll, people don't want to see you saying the health service is in good shape? No, what it's I'm, clearly not. I'm the so, first... So, I'm absolutely so what the are you going to do person. different? Yes, what I do different is make sure that we are dealing with the recruitment and retention issue. So that's why, just a couple of weeks ago, I launched, alongside the RCN and the RCM and other trade unions, a nursing and midwifery task force to deal with those two high levels. I'm the first one to say two high levels of vacancy. But actually, the NHS in Scotland, of course, continues to outperform every single other NHS in the entire UK. That's not down to good fortune. That's not down to coincidence. That's down to a good track record that shouldn't be trashed, particularly by members of our own party. Ash Regan, what would you do different? I think we do need to do things differently. I think we need to go in a different direction. I think it's very clear at this point that more targets and more managers are not going to fix the issues that we have in our NHS. What we need to do is support and listen to our NHS staff and empower them to lead the change that the NHS needs. And if I'm leader, I'm going to be inviting for, um, staff from every workplace in the NHS, whether um, they're clinical or support staff, to a summit so I can listen to them and they can tell me what needs to change in the NHS. I mean, you do, with respect, say this on every issue, as far as I can tell, that you're going to have a big meeting. You've got to have some ideas of your own. 
oh, you need to listen to the staff. The staff are the ones that are going to turn this around. We're in a position now where we're setting more targets. The staff are exhausted. I've been listening to nurses and midwives up and down this country, and they are telling me they're crying out for someone to listen to the staff and to help them to put the NHS back on track. Kate Forbes. Well, this comes back to competent delivery. I quite agree that we've had enough of summits, enough of conversations. We need to actually get better at delivery. We know what the problems are, we need to solve them. So if you take, for example, delayed discharge, which I've already mentioned, which is consuming vast sums of money uh, that could be better deployed uh, in social care. If we paid our social carers uh, a better wage, ensured that terms and conditions were fairer, if the National Care Service, which is you a have, pioneering initiative, you had the opportunity if we did that to pay our and delivered carers a higher wage in several budgets and you chose not to uh, do no, it and that's precisely by suggesting why, that you'll do it now, it seems a little bit opportunistic, That's I precisely say. why that uh, our carers are paid more than anywhere else in the UK because we work together to deliver that. But again, right now we're at a position where continuity won't cut it. We need to change. First and foremost, we are not going to win people to our cause if we're going to sit here and trash each other and talk down each other's record. The SNP has a good record. That SNP record, uh, that record in government has helped to win us support. Now, what we have to do with the NHS is listen to staff. I spend most days, most weeks talking to our staff and they tell me that one of the central issues that we have to improve, ultimately my responsibility and our responsibility in government, is to make sure our NHS is far more flexible when it comes to work practices. So that's why the Nursing and Midwifery Task Force, which will look at where, how more flexible we can be, will definitely help with that retention. Because you can recruit all you want, but if you're recruiting to a leaky bucket, it ain't going to help. So K we've got to make sure we retain our staff too. Kate Falls, when Hamza Yusuf talks about trashing the record, he's talking about your performance the other night. You've come in for a lot of criticism for that. Do you want to apologise for trashing his record? Well, we're electing here a future First Minister who will have to deal with some very weighty matters. The SNP hasn't had an election contest for 20 years, and I think we need to have the time and the space for robust, frank exchanges. I'm proud of the track record of our SNP government. I'm proud of the exceptional leaders we have. I'm proud of the members, the team members that we have around the cabinet table. But in an election contest, people don't want to hear that we're just going to do what we've always done. Are you done. proud of his record? If we, You're just not, do, if we just do what we've always done, then we'll get the same outcomes. And all of us here are agreed on the need for reform. And the question is, how do we deliver are, are that Are you reform? proud of his record? It's perfectly legitimate to set out in a contest like this an alternative vision and to maybe point to some strategic mistakes that we have been making as a party. However, I don't think attacking people personally is the way to go, and I have chosen not to do that myself because I don't think that's appropriate. Look, but look. clearly, if we're going to go for um, new leadership, and I think this is a time for a brave heart and not faint hearts. And when people tell you who they are, and they tell you that they're not going to do anything about independence and they're quite content with devolution, then people should listen to that. I'll answer your question directly. I'm proud of both my colleagues' records. Uh, Ash worked with me when I was Justice Secretary. Uh, Kate, I think, has done a very good job as a Finance Secretary. So I'm proud because, look, we are only going to win independence. We're only going to win support for our cause if we work together as a team. But what unfortunately happened in the last TV debate, Kate, is that you essentially gave our opponents so much ammunition to attack us with. In fact, Douglas Ross stood at First Minister's questions today and said, your words will be on every single Conservative and leaflet. And yet the future First Just, Minister... If you let me finish, if you don't interrupt, I didn't, I, I, didn't, I didn't interrupt you. So what you've done is you've handed the Conservatives and our opponents uh, material ammunition to attract and trash our record. Now you will be on every single leaflet. They don't fear you, Kate. They are rooting for you to win so that the your reason, words are on every single leaflet. The reason and they're that's talking why, about me. That's why we've got to make sure that we work as a team. But Robust reason, debate, for sure. The reason but let's that make sure that we don't me. let our opponents divide us. It's because they do fear me, as the polling shows. Ultimately, the future First Minister is not going to just win the support of SNP members. They have to reach out and win support from the wider public. And in terms of TV debates, I mean, the future First Minister is going to have to deal with a lot worse than we've been dealing with through this contest. They're going to have to stand up to the UK government. They're going to have to stand up to the opposition. And they're going to be accountable to the people of Scotland who want answers and they want to see competent delivery of right. results. Well, I, don't, I, I don't actually mind. But, I mean, I'm, trust me, I'm big enough and tough enough. I've taken many, I've done more TV debates, I suspect, than uh, any uh, of my colleagues. The point is, what you can't do is be in a government for as many years as you and I have been and then completely trash that Which record. I would never it do. is really That's disheartened our activists. I've our... had, I suspect you have had too, literally hundreds of messages from those activists who have been in our party for decades 
who have worked hard to build our support, who now feel that you have talked down every single is, is effort. That true, so let's Regan. make sure we don't do that. Do you think that's true, what Hamza Yusuf just said? Look, I think it's, it's perfectly acceptable in a contest like this to be able to set out an alternative vision and to admit where we might be able to do better. Okay. But we are successful as a party. I mean, clearly, that is in no doubt whatsoever. We've been winning election after election. And the public do trust right. us to a large extent to deliver their services. However, we can do better. And now is the time to think about a change and um, leading Scotland onto its rightful well, place in the United Nations, which is what I'll do really if want I'm us, the leader. People really want us to talk about the cost of living, the economy, how you're going to pay for all of this. Um, Hamza Yusuf, the IFS says that non-benefit spending will have to fall for a couple of years, and then it will rise modestly, but in five years' time, you'll still be behind where we are today. What are you going to cut? First of all, hold on. What you forgot to mention about the IFS report is because of the progressive taxation policies we've taken, people in Scotland in the lowest incomes are £2,000 better You're off. You're still so going to have gonna, to cut. No, so I'm going to make sure that we continue our progressive policies at raising, uh, we have raised tax for those who pay the highest. So you'll raise tax again? I've not said we'll raise it you again. Said, I think well, we've got the balance. It sounded no. like you were about to. I said I've got, we've got the balance right. What we need to do is make sure we grow our economy. So those people who are economically inactive, make sure we help to get them into work. That's why my flagship policy, Krishnan, was to accelerate the expansion of childcare for all one and two year olds. If we do that, we help to get particularly women back into work. That grows our revenue base and then, of course, helps us in relation to our taxation. But progressive taxation, I will plant my flag on progressive taxation because I think those who earn the most it should pay the most. For Kate Forbes, services. the progressive taxation actually came from the man filling in from you. Did you back it and would you do more of it? I do back it because it's the only way with an economy that is growing so slowly to actually raise the revenue that we need for our public services. But I would far rather favour an approach which increases economic prosperity as the route out of poverty How? for people in Scotland. Well, a number of ways. First of all, our small businesses are the backbone of the Scottish economy. They have come through COVID. They have come through Brexit. They have come through the cost of living crisis. We need to give them a bit of breathing space and allow them to ensure they keep their staff employed. The what, second what does breathing thing, space mean? Does that mean deregulation? Cut red it tape? It doesn't, but no more. No more. So when it comes to our approach right now, there are a number of excellent schemes uh, that are being proposed, which I back to the hilt. But we also need to make sure that when businesses say we can't, as a small business that maybe employs five people in a deprived community, when they say that those jobs are on the line because of the weight of government asks, we need to be cognizant of that. But the Scottish and, and economy... And tax cutting, would you cut tax for business? Not at the moment, because uh, in a low growth economy, uh, high tax is the only but way... But it's your ambition. It's the only way to increase the spending on our public services. But if we could grow our economy, which the Scottish economy has got great potential to do, then we expand the tax base and ultimately have more revenue for our public services. So you're pro-business... Don't, don't want more red tape. You'd like to cut tax, grow the economy. My over... You, you sound a bit like my, Liz Truss. My overriding... No, because she decided to uh, cut tax in a low-growth economy. That's not my proposal here. But my raison d'etre, my overarching mission, the reason I get up in the morning, is to eradicate poverty in Scotland. One in four children are in poverty tonight. One in four children are going to bed cold and hungry in a land where there is plenty of food and plenty of fuel. But that the, doesn't stack up and the, we need to eradicate that. You called that trickle down. But I did call idea? that trickle down. Trickle down is a discredited economic policy. Which is policy, policy why this isn't Which will down. not do anything for the communities in Scotland that are feeling left behind right now. These two candidates here want to stay in the straight jacket of the UK and Scotland cannot afford to stay in the UK any longer. We must get out of this union. And the best thing that we could do for the economy in Scotland is make sure that the Tories in London are not running it. Right, well, that's a way off. In the meantime, you've got to run the economy. So what, what's, your, what's your economic policy? In the meantime, you've it's got not to end going poverty. to be a way off if I'm the leader of the SNP. What is your economic policy I have before a plan you get independence? to get independence in the very short term. Do you have one policy for the economy? I or for eradicating just, just, poverty. Just I one do. policy for the economy. So in terms of the economy, I would say that the best way to do is invest and build. So I would build, build, build. I've already announced that I would restart infrastructure projects 
that the SNP had put on hold. How much did Those that cost? are well, we'll have to put them out to tender in smaller packages, which I but think see, would lead to. How would you pay is, for those infrastructure problems? Well, projects? there's already would money set. There's already money set aside for infrastructure investment, every, and that is way, the way that you build the economy. Every penny is in the, the budget. The North East is a powerhouse for the Scottish economy, and did we you hear must that? make sure that the roads and the infrastructure there are. But you see, this is the whole point. If you grow the economy, if you grow the economy, so Scotland has great resources. It's got energy resources. It's food and drink, it's tourism, and so on. Grow that, expand the tax base, and there's and far the more funding. No, 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 not at all. There's far more funding to invest in our infrastructure. Invest in infrastructure, and yes, the economy continues to grow. Hamza Yusuf, do, do, do you think Kate Forbes has done a good job with the economy? Uh, would, I, I would, would you keep her as your finance secretary? We well, we that's far. That's, I think that's a, a economy has question served. for me, Ash. Uh, I think Kate has done a good job, uh, and I think all my colleagues have done a good job. But let me just uh, say this. I agree that we have to absolutely create jobs, a green economy, and making sure that we unleash those tens of thousands of jobs and make Aberdeen the net zero capital of Europe is certainly part of it. But we have to have plans now, Ash. And when you talk about investing more money for infrastructure, if you've heard anything John Swinney has said as the Finance Secretary, you would know, of course, that every single penny of our budget is allocated. So where would you take money from to invest Well, let's in talk about one way that you could possibly raise money. Ash, Ash Reagan, in the next 10 years, should Scotland be exploiting more oil and gas or less? Well, what I've said is that oil and gas in Scotland um, supports a large number of jobs. It's about 70,000 jobs in Scotland. And I'm very clear that I'm standing up for Scottish jobs. We need to be very careful with the transition. I'm obviously committed to um, us getting to net zero and to making that transition to renewables. More or less. But we have to be very careful that we're not putting people in Scotland out of jobs, Higher hollowing out our communities whilst we're importing oil from other countries. That just doesn't make financial sense to us whatsoever. High, higher or lower? So I think we, that would have to be reviewed on a case-by-case -case basis. I wouldn't okay. like to say that we would have to exploit any more oil. But when you look at energy security, look at the situation we're in now. Kate Ford, Where more or less oil and gas? Less over the longer term. So and I fewer think, jobs? Uh, well, not if it's a just transition. Because we know that we're already attracting businesses and investment because of the potential when it comes to renewables. And the just transition means putting justice at its heart, not throwing jobs to the wind, but ensuring that those jobs have somewhere to go in our renewables industry. We've got huge potential, but we need to do this at a pace that works for those people in well-paid, secure jobs. Hamza Yusuf, more or less oil and gas in the next 10 less, years? Less, because, of course, the North Sea is a declining basin. And Scotland has so much renewable potential, over 60,000 jobs in the green economy. But I don't want to just create the jobs. I want to make sure that when people, when, when there's profit made from our renewables, that we take an equity stake in that. So the profit doesn't go just to the shareholders and the dividends, it goes to the people. So we just, not just harness the jobs, we make sure we, the people, get some of that profit too. Right, we're going to go to a break in a minute, but first a quick, quick fire round, and I'll begin with each of you for the, for, for the three questions. Um, so Hamza Yusuf first. Best First Minister of Scotland, Alex Salmond or Nicola Sturgeon? Nicola Sturgeon, hands down. Kate Nicola Forbes. Nicola Sturgeon's been an exceptional person to serve under. Ash Regan. Nicola Sturgeon. Interesting. Kate Forbes, Scotland's Head of State, King Charles or President Andy Murray? I think in the long term, this is a question for the people of Scotland, um, but I'm a big fan of Andy Murray. Ash Regan. Andy Murray every time. President Andy Murray. Hamza Youssef, King Charles or President Andy Murray? In the long term, President Andy Murray all the way. Right, Ash Regan, Gary Lineker's asylum tweets, red card or back of the net? Um, I have to say I didn't see them, actually, so I don't know, but um, let's give him a red card. Uh, Hamza Youssef, red card or is it back of the net goal? It's a hat-trick. He absolutely nailed it. Kate Forbes. Completely agree with the sentiment. An exclusive poll for this programme asked people how comfortable or uncomfortable do you feel about politicians voting on policies that affect people's marriage and relationships according to their personal religious beliefs? Now, both in terms of the general public and just SNP voters, there are large majorities of people who are uncomfortable with this idea of voting according to your religious belief. Hamza Youssef, does being First Minister for the whole of Scotland means saying you will not vote on these matters of gay equality, trans rights, abortion, according to your religious beliefs? So for me, it's very simple, because we've been asked these questions for weeks and weeks now, that my faith, and I'm a proud Muslim Christian, that 
my faith is not the basis by which I make legislation or policy. There are, of course, some exceptions. There are issues of conscience, and we come to an agreement as a government and as a party to allow free vote. But for the vast majority of votes, I think uh, it's very clear for me that religion, faith, should not be the basis of legislation. Because people need, not just in the leader of the SNP, but most importantly as First Minister, they need to know that the person who's First Minister is not just going to protect their rights, but advance them. And you and I know, and you've covered it in your news programme, that attacks are under, uh, equality is under threat. There are attacks on our rights. Look at Roe versus Wade. So they need to know that if there is an attack on our rights, on equal marriage, for example, that their First Minister will defend their rights, not just to the hilt, but also advance them where necessary. But would it and be would wrong? And could you serve, for example, a First Minister who did vote on these issues according to religious faith? I am unashamedly progressive, and we have done well with our progressive agenda in the SNP. If I was to be asked to be in a government, uh, I would have to uh, be comfortable that the progressive agenda that has won us so much support in this country, not just for the SNP, but for independence, that that was something that so the next First not. Minister was going to continue. Well, Kate Forbes, um, how will religious belief influence how you vote? It will influence how I lead in the same way as it influenced how I set my budgets. In other words, not at all. In three years, in three budgets, I have delivered financial decisions for all of Scotland's people, irrespective of who they are, where they're from, where they live, um, or whether they're a member of a minority group. And actually, you've seen at the heart of those budgets an approach to fairness an approach to progressive policies to ensure that we are making Scotland a more safe and secure place for minorities. And in this so, context... So you will never vote according to your religious conviction? Well, I think that... Is that what you're saying? I think I would agree with Hamza on this, that there are some issues where I think it's important to allow a conscience vote. And that's just not just for people of faith. That is for people of no faith at all. For example, on assisted dying, there will be a varying, there will be various views in the Scottish Parliament on an issue like that, and it's important that we do allow conscience votes on some issues. So religious but belief I've, would influence how you vote. But Why I've did you given, say it wouldn't influence it at all? Well, I was referring to my uh, my track record because ultimately people want to know. We're talking how, about the future now. Okay. Well, how I would serve in the future can be gleaned from how I've served in the past which is setting budgets without prejudice. And I've certainly said in this contest, I've given my honest and solemn pledge to uphold the legal protections that are in place for every Scot, whether they're male, female, whether they're gay or straight or trans. And that would be the approach that I would take. I think, I think the difference is that, that people, I don't think they take as much comfort as you might think they do. You know, you've often used the phrase that you'll tolerate people. Look, I'm a Muslim, in this, have, I'm, I'm, I'm a Muslim in this country. If somebody said to me, look, I don't agree with your lifestyle, but I'll tolerate you. It wouldn't give me a huge amount of confidence but that we're going to defend their I... rights. So we know where rights are under attack. If rights, for example, if somebody brought forward a member's bill to repeal equal marriage, they need to know that their leader, they can look in the eye and they believe that that leader will stand up for yeah, their rights I, when they're under attack. I and that's what champion. I don't think I you've been able to do so far. Hamza's right to be in government as a, a first minister or a serving cabinet secretary with a faith because I believe him when he gives his undertaking not to allow prejudice to shroud his judgment. I believe him, and what I'm asking from him is to believe me. And the question for him is, does he think I'm being honest or not when I give that solemn and honest pledge to uphold the protections for every so Scot? Because it's it's that's at it's, its heart, um, whether you can believe what I say or not. It's not for me, actually. It's our LGBTQ community, for example. I don't belong to that community, well, but they've written to me and there are hundreds to say, I'm course. afraid they don't believe that you'll stand up for their rights. And I think that's what we need from a leader who continues well, our progressive agenda, the regardless of the person of that's standing here who's actually done anything to stand up for their principles, of course, is me, because I'm the only nationalist minister that's ever resigned on a point of policy. I think that's, so, again, a personal attack on both Kate and I. Look, we no, work better when a, a we're fact. a team. I think we've all got principles. Let's not suggest that only one of us in this SNP family has principles. Are oh, you guided at all by religion? Ashley, no, I'm not religious. But I respect um, other people's views. You know, if people are religious, then I think we should respect right. their views on that. I mean, I, I think on the basis that you are saying that there will be some issues of conscience where you will vote according to your conscience, we need to work out what your positions are on a few things that are not absolutely clear at the moment. You've been clear, Kate Forbes, on things like um, gay marriage, that you would have voted against it. Um, we've seen how abortion rights have been reversed in America. Um, is abortion wrong? I'm a young woman. 
If there's ever anybody who understands the challenges when it comes to being a young woman and defending a young woman's rights, it's me. I've stated already that whilst I myself wouldn't have an abortion, I would uphold the legal provisions that are in place for women to access abortion services. That's no ifs, no buts, no maybes. I think that's quite a clear position. And indeed, it's probably well, the position. It's, it's, not a, it's not absolutely clear. I mean, I'm, I'm asking you, do you believe abortion is wrong? Well, and I've, I've given you the answer that there is a distinction between what I would do myself, which I think is actually the common view held by a lot of people but in Scotland in and beyond. In principle, for everyone, in, in, not in just for you, is abortion wrong? In principle, we have those legal provisions in place and I would uphold those legal provisions. And again, there's no ambiguity around that. So you can keep pushing me on whether something's wrong or not, but I've stated well, my I'm just position, asking for an answer. But... I've stated my position quite clearly when it comes to uh, those legal protections and my understanding of what it means to be a young woman. I think, I, think, I, think, I think that's a challenge. Uh, is, is, is that so? No, I'm, look, I, I don't believe abortion is wrong. If that's what you're about to, to, to ask me, in fact, even I need to ask you even, all the same of questions. Course, so and, we know and, where and, and you know, actually, even even in uh, the Islamic faith, of course, abortion is allowed under certain circumstances. But look, as, as the first minister and leader of the country, uh, I would say very, very clearly, not only would we want to uphold those rights, uh, I'd be a supporter of safe access zones, buffer zones, effectively, so people can't protest outside of abortion clinics. When Kate was asked this question the other day, in a hustings, uh, you said with balance. And what I, I didn't what it. I didn't understand was what you meant by with balance. For example, would you allow people to, to pray or have scripture this on a This is the idea of a safe space where protesters couldn't come, isn't yeah, it, around that, abortion that, that's right. But, but, so, but so, Kate, are, Kate, are you Kate, clearly well, in favour of Just that? let me yeah. finish. I've Kate, been quite Kate clear said from the beginning. she was in favour with balance. I think it's right think to ask, clear from the beginning. what do we mean by with balance? Would you allow, for yeah, example, prayer vigils to be... This is an be, example of uh, where you uh, see another candidate trying to poke holes and trying to erode the honest and solemn commitments that I have made. So it boils down to a question of honesty. Does Hamza accept my word when I say that I will uphold those legal protections and indeed support buffer zones or not? That's the bottom well, I, line. I, actually, the, okay. the, the question, if you don't mind, Christian, the question actually didn't come from me. It came from back off Scotland who tell me you haven't responded back Which is not true, uh, to the letter from right, a few well, days we've ago. We've got an answer tonight on that. Ash Regan. So I'm pro-choice and I think that healthcare for women um, with regard to abortion is extremely important access to have to have access to that health care right um now you said you resigned over trans rights no i resigned over the conflict with women's rights yes over, over the the gender recognition reform um can, can we just be clear um do, do you believe that trans men and women should have the same rights as adults as of course everyone else yes of so course. This, this is just about age or this is about self-id it's about self-identification yes right yeah um kate forbes similarly i mean you've talked about upholding the law but you're in a party i mean in westminster your party calls itself the gayest party in the world i think you've got a large number of gay colleagues they want to know whether you think what they do is right or wrong morally and i they are many of them are my friends they're my colleagues, I've served with them, and they've never expressed concern in the past because they know that I treat them not just with equal respect, but I treat them as people that are of more importance and more value than I myself am. And that is my uh, approach to them, that is my, uh, the value I place on them. I couldn't But to Hannah Bardell or Mary Black, people who express concern, do you think their lives, their, their sexuality is wrong? I think, uh, no, I don't. I think that the person that they are, the person that they want to be in a safe and secure, tolerant society, we have freedoms. We have freedoms of choice. And my job as First Minister, as I've displayed as the Finance Secretary, is to ensure that we protect those freedoms. Hamza Youssef, is there anything morally no, wrong I've been, again, about uh, no, LGBT uh, no. No, no, lives? And, and, and no again. Um, so let me also say this, that what people need to do and, and they, they rightly expect from their First Minister is that they can look that person in the eyes and genuinely believe that that person does not believe that they are morally inferior. 
that they will protect their rights, they will advance their rights. And I'm the only candidate uh, that has uh, unequivocally said that they will protect everybody's rights, whether you're trans, whether you're LGB, Briefly, uh, whether you're lesbian. What the party or needs is a leader that represents the values of the wider party. And what we need in a First Minister is somebody that can carry the country. Are they not the values of the wider party? Is that what you're saying? I think we need a leader that represents the values of the party and that can carry the country as well. Can I just, key, say, can I just can say, say, key, say key value, one of the key values is to make Scotland a safe and secure place for minorities. That includes all minorities. That's my ethnic minorities, that is religious minorities. And yesterday it was put to me that Scotland uh, is largely made up of, of atheists, which means that people of faith, including a Christian faith, are now minorities. We either live in a pluralistic and tolerant society where we can live together okay. and defend one another's rights, or we don't. Right, we, we have got to turn to the crucial question for your party of how you deliver independence. Um, Ash Regan, our poll shows you are the least likely person to deliver independence. Why are the people of Scotland wrong about you? I am the only person, I believe, that's in this contest that actually has a plan to, de to deliver independence. So I'm suggesting that we set up an independence convention. So that is an attempt to unite the movement. So that's the wider movement, um, other political parties, um, other organisations and groups from the Yes campaign of old, and that we inspire that and lead that. Because I think that we're not going to be able to do this alone. We need to do it together. So I haven't waited to become the leader. I've actually started reaching out and having those conversations already to try to unite so that. So you bring movement. back Alex Salmon, for example? I've had conversations with all the pro-independence party leaders. They're all very excited and inspired to start working together to work towards a better Scotland for all of us. And then I'm suggesting that we set up a commission. So this would be a body that would be set up in order to do the planning, the preparation, and to build the infrastructure indeed to get Scotland ready to become independent. Do, do you see and Alex I Salmond believe... in your first government in an independent Scotland? Alex Salmond is in an entirely different political party. If he rejoined the SNP, or I if he wanted I, to, would I you take him back, him, would I you put him in government? I wouldn't let him rejoin the SNP. He's in another political right. party at the moment. But I think we certainly need to work across the movement. But the Commission will be very important because we need to build that confidence with the people of Scotland that Scotland has what it takes yeah. and that it's ready. So currency would be one example of that. Before we get to that, you get, let's say you get your 50% plus one yeah. in, the, in the election. Um, what happens when London doesn't answer the phone and just says no? Have you asked them? Now, let's assume it's going to happen because that's kind of, you know, what it looks like. What, what are you going to do? Well, what I would say to you is this, that there are 65 different countries that have left the British Empire or the UK. And in worse. every no. single one of those, Westminster started off saying no, and then eventually they said yes. Hamza Yusuf, why isn't 50% plus one good enough for independence? Well, actually, I want to build a consistent majority, and that's the word, a consistent sustained majority for independence because that is our route a to independence. Our route, is not to our route to independence. independence. I didn't interrupt you, Ash, but our route to independence is actually quite simple. Our opponents want us to talk endlessly about process. Actually, what we have to be talking about is policy. We have to be inspiring people with our vision to independence. If we do that, much like we got the Scottish Parliament, those political obstacles will disappear. But the process is and important, and we've spent a lot of time talking about policy. The process I, is important I, I, because I, London is, at the moment, refusing you a referendum. I accept there's some suggestion that if you get 50% plus one, that the UK government will march up the road to Edinburgh and begin negotiations is for the birds. In fact, just in the last couple of days, we have seen the UK government says, say we will not respect international law when it comes to uh, the issue of refugees coming on small boats. So to think that somehow uh, they will just uh, accept 50% plus one, what we have to do is fight every single election, including the next general election, on the issue of independence. But, but from, don't wait for that. End, In Can't the fall. meantime, make sure you grow consistent support for independence. Ha build the economic case, the well-being economy. Inspire people to that Both vision. Labour and the Conservatives are clear they are not interested in another referendum. You can win as many elections as you like. What are you going to do about it? Well, this is where your polling is really important because ultimately you need a leader who can reach out to no voters and persuade no voters to vote yes. You know, everybody within the SNP and the Yes movement... Yeah, but you're not going to get the referendum. Everybody within the SNP and the Yes movement is already agreed on independence. In order to build support, we need to reach out to no voters and we'll reach them through competent government with a competent leader and making the economic case for independence. How do you get the referendum? When, 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 when there is, we're not going to get a referendum. Over the last few years, well, I'm 
we're not I'm going not so to sure get about that because over the last few years, despite the barrage of attacks from the UK government on devolution, we haven't seen the dial shift on independence as much as I would have liked. But I think we need a more intentional approach to yeah. reaching no voters, and that is through gentle persuasion and making the economic case. Ash Regan. What we need to do is build confidence with the Scottish public, but we also need to match that up with trust in government, and then we need to match it up with a process that will get us to independence. Building support by itself and reaching out to no voters in themselves are not a route to um, recognising the democratic wishes of the people of Scotland. And let's just remember this. The referendum is not the gold standard here. The ballot box is the gold standard. And in a democratic country, there is authority in the mechanism of the ballot box. We know this because the Supreme Court judgment recently confirmed that. So the UK government cannot hold Scotland hostage. They've been trying to do that because they've been trying to deny the democratic will of the Scottish people by stopping us from having a referendum. H Hamza, However, Yusuf, briefly, how are you going to persuade Scotland London cannot to change be held mind? hostage let, let, by the UK government. Let's just remember how we got the Scottish Parliament. We got the Scottish Parliament because we built that settled will. It's like Canon Kenyon Wright. He was part of the independence uh, part of the convention in relation to the Scottish Parliament. What he said was, he gave that quote: uh, "We are the state. We say no." We are the people, we say yes. So you okay. build that popular support, then independence becomes politically in, inevitable. In the last few seconds, Ash Regan, our poll shows you third, and these two neck and neck. Your second preference votes are crucial. So who does your second preference go to? Kate Forbes or Hamza Yusuf? Well, what we need to remember is that in this contest, it's one member and one vote. And we have, if um, the members of the SNP would like a candidate that's happy with... I need a name. With, if they're happy seconds. with devolution, they have two people they can pick from. If they want someone that has a plan to deliver independence, they need to vote okay. for Ash Regan. We must leave it there. Didn't get the answer, but never mind. Thank you all very much. Indeed, that's it for tonight. We're back at 7 tomorrow. Till then, that's Channel 4 News. Good evening.